Okay. No, I guess. Uh, so my name is uh, Jens Himmler. So uh, I grew up in Belgium in a, a town in the province of Antwerp. Uh, then I went to study in, uh, at Ghent University. And uh, my PhD was at uh, Antwerp University, uh, also in Belgium, uh, with uh, a supervisor, Yves Le Brun. And uh, now I'm doing a postdoc at Antwerp, U Antwerp University. And was there another question I should answer? No, that's good. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> and uh, today I will talk about uh, EILC toposes. Um, so I don't know how often you have seen uh, toposes mentioned already. Um, in this talk I will restrict to uh, Brodenic toposes. So what is a Grotendieck topos? It's a category equivalent to sheaves on site. So um, a topos, uh, in the sense of Grotendieck, is associated to a small category here, C. And this is a Grotendieck topology, which is a generalization of uh, topology uh, like on topological spaces. So uh, I will not say much about the precise definitions. Um, instead, I will uh, have a look at some examples. So the first example that you can look at is pre sheaf toposes, and this is already a really large family of toposes. So as, as soon as you know about categories, um, for every small category C, you can look at the pre sheaf topos of C which is the same thing as a category of functors from the opposite category to the category of sets. Um, another example is maybe you have worked with topological spaces. So uh, for any topological space X, um, you can look at sheaves on X, and what is it is a functor from the open sets of X to sets. Again, you have to take uh, contravariant functors, so you have to look at uh, functors on the opposite category. Um, And OX is here the open subsets of X and inclusions between them. And then you have also to uh, consider this uh, sheaf condition on these functors. Such that, so the condition is that for any um, matching family, of uh, if you have an open covering and uh, elements in F of U I for uh, for each I, then. Then you can glue all these uh, different elements to a unique element S. 
and f of u. And here, uh, the u i is form an open covering of u. So um, these uh, sheaves on x as a category uh, give another example of a Grothian dictopos. And then, um, well, maybe it's good to mention that uh, if you look at sheaves on x, that this is uh, equivalent to the category of local homeomorphisms to x. So a sheaf is the same thing as a local homeomorphism. Okay, and uh, then you can also look at the uh, intersection of the two. So if here are the topological spaces, and here are the pre-sheaf toposes, so the two examples that we looked at. Then, um, well, it's, it's known by topos theorists that here in the intersection you have uh, pre-sheaf toposes on uh, partially ordered sets. So uh, we have these two examples and you have a non-trivial intersection. You can have something that is both sheaves on a topological space and pre-sheaves on a partially ordered set. So um, Your examples from algebraic geometry are, are neither of those, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, except if you take the Zariski topology, right. then you have a topological right, I mean space. Your topos. But, yeah. Uh, I like working the, with the tau topos and then it's that's, not. That's neither of those though. Mm. Yeah. Or at least very rarely uh, if you look at. <laughs> and that's the origin of topos theory. Mm. Okay. So for example, if you look at uh, the, the real numbers, which is a point in, uh, in algebraic geometry. So. Uh, you look at this scheme associated to this room of real numbers, then you can show that this is in fact a, a pre sheaf topos. So it's a pre sheaves on the group with two elements. Mm. Um, so, what does this mean? The group with two elements as a category is, is a category with one object and two morphisms. And, and then the composition of morphisms in the category is exactly the multiplication law for the group. So, so the reason why this holds, that the tau topos of this point here is this topos, is because this is the Galois group of the real numbers, the, the, the absolute Galois group. But this kind of situation is really rare and in general, uh, schemes will not be topological spaces and also not pre-sheaf toposes. Can I ask you about that intersection? So are you saying that if I have sheaves on a topological space and mm -hmm. it's a pre-sheaf topos, then that topological space is like an Alexandrov space? Like it yes, comes uh, from Bosa? Mm -hmm. That's an if and only if? Yeah. Well, um, at least sheaves on this topological space is a uh, same thing as sheaves on an Alexander of discrete space. Or, um, well, you have two different definitions, but... Um, uh, okay, so the answer is yes to your question, but there's a, a slight problem that it's possible for two topological spaces to have the same uh, associated topos. So this is some detail that you have to, uh, to uh, consider. But if it's sheaves on topological space and it's a pre-sheaf topos on some category, 
then there's also a way to write it as precious on a on partial order, and then that's exactly the Alexandrov uh, spaces. Thanks. So it sets process with Alexandrov topology. So uh, what does this look like? For example, the Sierpinski space. This is a space with two elements, and the open sets. Uh, my personal convention is to uh, take as open sets the sets that are upwards closed. So there are two open sets here, this one and this one. And then of course the empty, empty set is also open, so three open sets. Um, this one I usually call uh, G and this one M. So this is because of my background a little bit in algebraic geometry, where G means generic point and M means maximal ideal. But that's just the name. So um, you can uh, make nice drawings of these post sets. Um, so uh, another example would be You can look at the natural numbers. And then uh, ordered in the usual uh, order of the natural numbers. And then you can get a post set. Then, uh, so this gives a, a, another topos that you can work with uh, very easily. Okay, maybe I should say first something about uh, geometric morphisms. So, so if you want to discuss toposes, then you should also look at the morphisms between toposes. Um, and here, if you look at pre-sheet toposes, then we would like that for any functor between, uh, from a category C to a category D, you get also an induced functor on the toposes. So, um, for every functor, uh, I call it phi from uh, C to D. And we can show that there are uh, functors from the pre sheaved topos on C, the pre sheaved topos on D. So, what is this functor? Um, uh, I'll first describe another one going in the other direction. So, what does this functor? You take a pre sheaved on D. And then you uh, build a pre sheaf on C from it. And how do you do that? Well, uh, applying your sheaf to an element of uh, an object of C is just first applying phi and then uh, taking uh, elements. So uh, this is one uh, possible way to uh, construct a functor. This is called the pullback. Uh, we call it F upper star. And this functor has both a uh, left adjoint F lower shriek and a right adjoint F lower star. So, uh, I don't know if you've heard already about adjunctions. Uh, yeah. So one of the main results with the adjunctions is that if something has a left adjoint, then it preserves uh, limits, and if it has a right adjoint, it preserves four limits.
So here you know that that upper star preserves both limits and co-limits. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here uh, for topological spaces, uh, suppose that you have a continuous map of topological spaces. Then you get something similar, you get Again, uh, a functor f upper star and a right adjoint f lower star. With f upper star preserving finite limits. And then the definition of a geometric morphism. between toposes F and E. There's an uh, adjunction where you have uh, a left adjoint F upper star and a uh, right adjoint F lower star with F upper star preserving finite limits. So this covers the two examples. Here we already said that it preserves finite limits. And here it has a left adjoint. So then we know that it preserves all limits, not, not, uh, not even just the finite ones. This might be a dumb question, but I never understood this. because So F lower star up there is actually the restriction map there yeah. to the opposite of like the open mm. categories, right? Um, so then F upper star is F shriek there, mm. but f lower star there doesn't exist here, right? Mm -hmm. Because there it's given by right con extension, but why doesn't it work here? Mm. Um, yes, uh, first of all, it's uh, of course very confusing because the one on the left here is the one on the right there. Yeah. Um, okay, and then the, the problem why it doesn't work is uh, usually you uh, this is for topological spaces, so it's uh, oh, I'll write it down in full. So you have this map phi. Does it take sheaves to sheaves? Uh, but can you still take comic section? So this is a uh, phi inverse, oh, sending well, open sets to open sets here. Okay. Um, so then you have pre sheaves on OY to pre sheaves on OX. So here you have this uh, left adjoint. You can take the right count kind of extension, but it might not preserve the limits. So it can't be a right action. Yes, so... Uh, Sorry to interrupt. No, no problem. So uh, another way of looking at it is, uh, well, here you have not only that you have this F lower shriek, but also it preserves finite limits, in this case of topological spaces. Basically because this one here preserves finite intersections, and then this one will preserve finite limits here. Um, so you not only have a geometric morphism in this direction, but you also have one in the other direction, consisting of uh, F lower shriek and F upper star. And then you can try to restrict it to, uh, okay, to You, you take into account the Grothendieck topology now, and this all works well. So here uh, you still get a left adjoint and a right adjoint, but the extra right adjoint that you have here it does not appear 
here when you take the growth in deep topology into account. So that's, yeah, because... Right adjoint doesn't restrict the sheaves, mm -hmm. and you can't sheepify because the sheepification is a left adjoint. It's mm -hmm. not going to work. But his question is, why don't you take the right tan extension? And the reason that doesn't work is because it doesn't change anything. Uh, the right tan extension won't preserve uh, um, finite limit, won't preserve limits. So it can't be a right adjoint. Mm -hmm. Oh wait, so if I took X and I have like sheafification after you made up, yeah. I don't want it. No, you can't follow sheaf you can't follow the right adjoint, the lower star by sheafification, that won't give you an adjoint. Mm -hmm. Oh okay. Thanks. Mm -hmm. so those three the middle one is supposed to be like an induced module, the left one is supposed to be an uh, extension of scalar, and the other one is the co-extension, right? Uh, I don't know the terminology, but uh, I do know that this is called the left can extension, mm -hmm. and this is called the right can extension, I think, yeah. No, in terms of like a like module category. Um, I don't really know what they're the, the right... Ah, yes, so this is uh, like a forgetful functor? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Then that I, one I agree. is a uh, tensor or... Uh, uh, yeah, just tensor. And this is tensor... And this one is co-restriction, like... Uh, mm. yeah. So, uh, I worked a lot with Morgan Rogers on the case where you have... Uh, where M and N are monoids, and then a functor between these monoids is just the same as a monoid homomorphism. And in this case, if you look at these three uh, different functors, then what do you get? So the one in this direction is the forgetful functor. Yeah. You have a set with an n action, and then you get an m action by first applying phi and then taking the n action. Uh, this one is uh, tensoring, so really extension of scalars. Yeah. Uh, similar to what happens in ring theory, and then here we have the home set. Uh, yeah, that's the code sense. Yeah, so that's uh, what you mean. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, I, I was trying to, like, the failure of the 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 shift one to have another functor, another right adjoint. It's mm. the it's about the uh, like like the algebraic reason behind it. Yeah. Because there. What we have is like we have a f upper negative one, and then we have to tensor it with the structure shift, right? Mm. Yes, uh, I haven't thought about that very much. Uh, how to look at it algebraically? It would be interesting to to see what happens algebraically if you add this topology. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So now. Uh, we already have enough theoretical uh, baggage to look at some examples. Because you know if we are in this intersection of toposes on both sets, then we can just look at maps of both sets. For example, this one. Or this one. So again, the open sets are the sets that are upwards closed. And by up, I mean literally up in the room. Um, so uh, can you maybe see which one of these is a local homeomorphism? So that's maybe a fun thing to try to figure out. One? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, that's the that's the local homeomorphism. So the reason is, um, so 
we can take this open set and it maps homeomorphically to this one. And we can also take this open set and the same thing happens. And this is an open covering of the whole space, so then we have local homeomorphism. And here uh, that doesn't happen because uh, if you want an open set containing this point, then you get the whole space. Mm -hmm. And that does not map homeomorphically to this. So this one is not local homeomorphism. Uh, I also use the name et al for uh, local homeomorphisms. So, uh, and that's where uh, complete spreads now uh, pop up. So, uh, this is a, a branched covering. So why? Um, this uh, this is a notion uh, developed by Marta Bon and uh, Jonathan Funk. And in this case, uh, complete spread uh, means exactly the dual of et tau. So because this is the opposite category of the lower one, this is et tau, so this must be a complete spread. Mm. What does a complete spread look like, to, like in terms, like for example, a real etal cover? Like, what's the opposite to it? What's the antithesis of a, like a real etal cover of, say, like a scheme? Yeah, uh, I'm not the best like? person to ask, but. <laughs> oh, sorry. It's uh, a good question. Yeah. We're working on that. <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> We're working on that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So yeah, for, for schemes, not much uh, is done with complete spreads. Yes. But it's a quite an interesting case mm. because it's one of these topuses that's neither a space or a, or a pre-sheet topos mm. in which the complete spreads are, are well, it's straight, it's sort of known, but in these other topuses uh, that are neither, it, it, so in terms of algebraic geometry, it's the worst topos, like because <laughs> it tells once we have it tells homology, we solve a lot of things with it. But yeah. that one, it just ramifies so much that, is that what you're saying? Uh, uh, no, no, I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying we're interested in this case because mm -hmm. it actually hasn't been calculated as far as yes. I know. As far as I know. And it's not so easy also to... But uh, if what you're saying is so, then it's, it's great. <laughs> it's more interesting. So um, I will talk uh, today about uh, essential geometric morphisms. an essential geometric morphism um, is a geometric morphism where there is the additional left adjoint at lower shriek. So for every functor you have this induced geometric morphism and this one is essential. And there's a converse result as well, that for uh, if your uh, category um, is closed under ad importance, then any functor between uh, these categories, um, no, any essential geometric morphism will come from a functor. Okay, and then we can ask, well, we understand essential geometric morphisms here. What are essential geometric morphisms between topological spaces? And um, that's a more difficult question. Um, for example, here we are in the intersection, so that we know what the essential geometric morphisms are. So maybe we can get a little bit of intuition here. So uh, I know 
basically uh, two different ways of constructing essential geometric morphisms. One is this one, which was uh, used by a firm between categories. And then you get an essential geometric morphism between the pre-sheaf toposes. The other one is uh, by looking at locally connected geometric morphisms instead. So a geometric morphism is locally connected. Um, well, first of all, it has to be essential. of this form, so between different, uh, so an interaction between the different uh, functors in the adjunction. And this is called the Frobenius condition. So this is an extra condition that you have to put on essential geometric morphism and then they are called locally connected. So why are they easier in some sense? I'm sorry, did you, what is that? What is AX and B? Um, so you have to take objects in the toposis, just general objects in the toposis. So here, uh, after upper star starts, is a functor going from E to F, and then A is any object in, in E, and X is any object in F. And also, is there like, is it like known when, when a map of topological spaces will induce a central geometric morphism? Um, uh, the locally connected ones are pretty well known. Mm. Um, uh, I'll, I'll give some examples. So, uh, what are some properties? Well, locally connected uh, ones are uh, stable under composition, but that's uh, more or less the case of any, any property of geometric morphisms that you would be interested in. Um, and the other properties that are more worth mentioning is if you have a morphism from a topos E to the topos of sets. Topos of sets is kind of like the base point, just a point. Then this is essential if and only if it's locally connected. So, uh, and then a second property is. Um, yeah, for, for topological spaces. When is this essential or equivalently locally connected? Um, this is precisely if the topological space X is locally connected. So this gives already a lot of examples because Locally connected spaces are, uh, well, most of the topological spaces you work with in algebraic uh, topology, for example, are locally connected. Um, and then a third condition, uh, it's stable under pullback. So if you want to use this property, you have to know uh, how to compute pullbacks of uh, toposes. But it's uh, more or less the same as with topological spaces, or very similar at least. Uh, the fourth one is can be uh, locally connectedness can be checked by eta locally. So if you have a jointly surjective family of local homeomorphisms uh, to E, and 
and you want to know if this uh, f from f to e is locally connected, you can look at all the pullbacks and check if they are all locally connected and then f is locally co connected as well. And then the last one, um, if tau maps are locally connected, and locally connected maps are open. So I'm just stating a lot of properties without proof, just to give some intuition, and uh, because I'm actually more interested in looking at the examples here. So, so what is an example? Using these properties, we can kind of build a lot of different examples just by combine, combining the different uh, properties. For example, a circle is a locally connected topological space. Um, and then you can, uh, for example, apply pullback So here we are with uh, working with uh, completely uh, no uh, Hausdorff locally compact spaces, and then products of toposes agree with the products of the topological spaces. It's a result by Picado and Poulter that you can just compute uh, products of Topos that way in this case. So you can, for example, take the product with the plane and it will still be locally connected. And then we can, for example, use this uh, fourth property. And then uh, there's this uh, hop vibration that is uh, very well known in uh, algebraic topology and uh, also by differential geometers. So this is something that locally looks like this. Locally it's just a copy of uh, S3 with uh, S1. No, a copy of S2 with S1. So uh, locally it looks like this and uh, that means with this fourth property that this is also a locally connected map. So you can construct really complicated examples just using all these, uh, these uh, basic properties. shouldn't have erased this. Then uh, one thing you can do is try to look at these examples and see if they are locally connected. Um, so the lower one was a town. So this one is locally connected. And then for the upper one, you could look, well, maybe if it was locally connected, then this map should have locally connected fibers as well. So what are the fibers? Above this point, you have just a single point. And up above this point, you have a discrete space with two points. So, yeah, both fibers are locally connected. They're both just discrete spaces. So that doesn't help. Um, and I think it's rather difficult to show that this map is not locally connected. So this is uh, a result also by uh, Bunge and Funk. That uh, something which is a complete spread. And uh, locally connected is also a tau. And we know that this one is not a tau. Ah. So then it's, it's not locally connected. 
uh, I don't know a different proof. Maybe you can find another way to base change it to get something that you know is not locally connected. Mm -hmm. but, uh, might be difficult. Um, another example where it's a bit more clear that it's uh, not locally connected is if we look at an infinite binary tree. This goes up infinitely, and then you can project on the natural numbers. So here again, all fibers are uh, locally connected. They're all uh, discrete spaces with 2 to the k elements. Um, but there's also a secret fiber. Here, uh, the points are just the natural numbers. But this is points in the sense of topology. In the sense of topos theory, you have another point. The like the generic point? Yes, indeed. Mm -hmm. So, I'll, I'll call this uh, pre-sheaves on N with the usual ordering. Points in topos theory are defined as maps from topos of sets to this topos. And for each natural number here you get such a geometric morphism but also there's another one which corresponds to the geometric point here so you have a point at infinity can you say what that is as a functor uh, yes so if here you have uh, um, yeah so this is Oh, it's the co-limit of the stocks, right? Yeah, indeed. Uh, so this is like a, a pre-sheaf on this thing is a sequence of sets which would match between them. And then the taking uh, stocks at this generic point means exactly taking the point. Is the generic fiber the only obstruction to local connectedness? Um, no, because here it was already not locally connected. So. But here, okay, what happens here is that here, uh, just like you get a generic point here, you get here a generic point for every uh, irreducible downwards closed set. Mm -hmm. So that means that here you get uh, a Cantor set. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can see it. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a very complicated set which is definitely not locally connected because every component is just a point mm -hmm. and it's not the union of components. So here uh, you get the counter set and then that's the fiber. Counter set is not locally connected so this map also can't be locally connected. So this is the, just a, a lot of different examples. And then we can ask, for example, uh, the only time we really got a fiber that is not locally connected was at this kind of infinite point. So is this a coincidence? Will you also, will you always have locally connected fibers at more well-behaved points? Uh, so this is something that we will look at. Um, and for that we need the uh, Bechstein-Valle conditions. So what is a Bechstein-Valle condition? Well, if you have uh, two toposes, F and E, and another two toposes f prime e prime. So uh, I always use the same names for my uh, geometric morphisms in such a diagram, because then it's uh, more difficult to get confused. Um, okay. So you start with a diagram like this, and then the back 
Chevalet condition uh, says that um, if you first do Okay, I'll, I'll first write the other one that I know better. So there are, there are two uh, Beck-Chevalet conditions that are equivalent. So this is the first one. So it's about an interaction between the different functors. Um, okay, really the Beck-Chevalet condition says that there is a particular morphism that must be an isomorphism. But for this talk, let's just write that the beck chevalet condition is that they are isomorphic to two functors. Um, if these two functors are isomorphic, then that means that their right adjoints are also isomorphic. So then we get another way to write the same uh, beck chevalet condition. Um, So this is a different way to formulate it. And this one is maybe the better way, because here you don't need to have, you need, don't need to be in a situation where you actually have this uh, f lower shriek. This does not need to exist if you formulate it this way. Okay, so why do we care about the uh, beck chevalet condition? Uh, for example, it allows us to formulate this Frobenius uh, property uh, for uh, locally connected geometric morphisms. So for any object in a topos, the slice category over this object is again a topos. Uh, and it's a base change. So uh, for each object of the topos, you can take the base change along it, which is, gives another uh, a topos. Uh, and then the property that F is locally connected, this Frobenius condition, is precisely the beck chevalet condition in this diagram. Just e over a over Yeah. So what does the beck chevalet condition say? Um, first, taking F lower shriek, and then taking the pullback here is the same thing as first taking the pullback and then uh, taking half lower shriek. And taking pullbacks, you can take that uh, quite literally, is here you have uh, something over B, and then you take the pullback over, uh, with A. So, uh, this is just a, a side note that you can use the Beck Chevalet conditions to. to uh, formulate this locally connectedness criterion in a different way. So it's kind of like a decent, but not quite, right? Uh, yes, it's a kind of indeed, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, these uh, beck chevalet conditions uh, often pop up the in... Monadic descent, yeah. Uh, in fiber category theory, uh, and, and that's kind of a descent argument, yeah. Do you know, like, what kind of object descends on it. Like for example we know like in FPPF the uh, sites like things like mm. modules descends or uh, quasi affine morphisms descent. Do you know what kind of thing that 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 this thing descends? Yeah so uh, if you have a, a locally connected Geometric morphism. Um, 
and you have here uh, another geometric morphism with a certain property. There are uh, various properties you can look at. Uh, then it often happens that uh, the pullback of this morphism will again have the property, just because this is locally connected. Well, often you don't even need that it's locally connected. But still. And if this is a locally connected surjection, you need the surjectivity also for this kind of descent arguments. Then, if this is a locally connected surjection and this has a certain property, then this will also have this property in many cases. But uh, so, uh, one is uh, I don't know which one is most relevant at the moment, but I think tidy geometric morphisms. You have this property that if this is tidy and this is a locally connected surjection, then this will be tidy as well. But the terminology for properties of geometric morphisms is often very different from the one in algebraic geometry. So it's not so easy to compare the two situations. Okay. Uh, I'll uh, now mention a theorem. So. Uh, the, this theorem is mentioned, for example, in, uh, in uh, Sketches of an Elephant, the Topos Theory book by Peter Johnston. Um, and it's about these uh, commutative diagrams. So we suppose that this is a pullback. And then the theorem is that if uh, F is locally connected, or P is tidy, then the back Chevalet condition holds. And I didn't define yet what tidy is. Uh, the formal definition is uh, that the F uh, or P lower star preserves uh, E index filtered coordinates. But that's not a definition that's uh, easy to work with. So uh, to, to use this result in practice, I uh, use an extra result that says that closed inclusions are tidy. So tidy morphisms, that's maybe something complicated, but closed inclusions, that's, we really have a geometric intuition about that. And for topological spaces, um, they uh, correspond to the mm the closed subsets. So uh, we know that if we take here a topological space and here a closed subset, then we automatically get this big Chevalier conditions. And, then, no. and that means that F is locally connected? I'm a little confused. Uh, no. That's an assumption. It, you need one of the two conditions. You have this back Chevalet condition if F is connected, uh, locally connected. And if uh, you also have the same back Chevalet condition under the condition that P is tidy. But you care about the back Chevalet because it tells you when a map is locally connected. Mm. So we will use uh, soon uh, the back Chevalet conditions to show that certain maps are locally connected. Take um, suppose that we have an essential map between topological spaces. Then what can we do? We can look here at the closed point. 
closed point is in particular a closed subset. So this one is tidy. It's a closed point. And then here we can look at the fiber about this point X. And then we have a diagram where we have our uh, Bexia Valley condition. So uh, the kind of topological spaces that you work with in uh, algebraic topology, all the points are closed. In general, for Hauser spaces, all points are closed. The complement is open. Uh, this doesn't work for any topological space for all topological spaces. For example, uh, in our example here, so what are the closed points? This one, this one, and this one. So here you have fewer closed points. Okay, and uh, so why do we care about this Big Chevalet condition? Because we can now relate the different functors, the, the functor G upper star to the functor F upper star, for example. Uh, proposition um, if the Chevalet condition holds. And F is essential and then G is essential as well. So uh, I use this one, these notations. So assuming it's a pullback? Yes, assuming it's a pullback. Um, so uh, in, in the paper that I wrote, uh, I use this notation that the back chevalet condition holds, and then I, I write the map P below. And then to, to signify that it's a pullback, I use this line under the triangle. So that's just the notation I like to use. OK, so uh, what's the proof? So to show that something has a, a left adjoint, we, it's enough to show that it's, uh, it preserves co-limits, at least in our setting. Um, so we want to show that G star preserves co-limits. And we also know that the Big Chevalet condition holds. So, uh, to turn. Yeah, it's like this. Okay, so on the left-hand side, P lower star preserves limits because it's a right adjoint. F upper star preserves limits because uh, F is essential, so F upper star has this uh, left adjoint F lower shriek. So this functor here preserves limits. And the functor here is just... Um, this Q will again be a closed inclusion. So this will be a, a fully faithful functor. Um, we know that the composition of the two will preserve co limits, is equal to this one. And uh, then, because Q lo lower star is a conservative functor, you can then show that uh, G upper star itself preserves coordinates. So you can use this cancellation property. Um, well, maybe even easier is we know that Q lower star, G upper star preserves uh, coordinates. Um, 